product of my environment. Book three. Prologue. Yeah, it seems like a minute since I spoke to you guys. Obviously, I was on lockdown for a hot second. Hence why I had to get the professional actor to read, narrate um, book two. Controversial. But anyway, before I do a book three, let me do a book two. Yeah, a lot of you guys have been coming at me the last week or so. And explaining how, you know, um, you know, you want to listen to book two, you haven't listened to it yet, and it's, you know, COVID and bills and so I just thought, fuck it, you know what? I'm gonna share the love and just give it to you lot free in it. So, yeah, over the, the coming days, um, the product of my environment book two will be published via the Game Changing Moment YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that, yeah? Book three. Okay. I feel like we've, I feel like we've raised the bar with book three. Production level, you know, uh, the sound effects, ridiculous. The writing, yeah. Yeah, the, the level's been raised by everybody involved in this project. You know, it's just about giving you like giving you guys like the best product. You know, come on, man. You know, everyone's trying to do this audio book thing now, and which we're cool with. We just raise the bar. It's, you know, like that. Yeah. So anyway, boom. This prologue, take it in, man. You know, this is this is this is the real truth. Forget it. This is the real. You know, like that. No one else can't really give you this kind of. You know, like that. Yeah, you got all these blogs and these fucking. Uh, I don't want to get into it, but yeah, you got all these blogs and these fucking snitches and whatever who are trying to rewrite history and push certain narratives on you. And yeah, it's, it's kind of bizarre just watching them. Do you get me? But we'll deal with them another day. Enjoy. This is the realest shit. Yeah. Went down like that. Yeah. Normal. Anytime I speak to Trevor, I tell you, yo, what go on, show? It's me, yo, no, nah, man. That's money, cuz, man. It's show, cuz. You feel me? So I go on, money, you good? The car search. I say, nah, you know, that thing's set. Me, me, me. You just stand. <laughs> come on, fam, man. Shut the thing down. Don't come in no fucking show thing for me, fam. Yeah, you man that took that from the yard, fam. Man, don't take nothing from the yard, innit? Except for our heritage, you feel me? After that, we're English and we deal with our thing over here, innit? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, we're big, bad, and wicked over here still as well, you understand? Because, yeah. The old, the old blood clot thing, yeah, they built up a fair. I tell you this, yeah, man, I don't give a fuck about the system, you feel me? Yeah. Yeah, we money over here, cuz. You don't care, innit? You feel me? I mean, don't come for us until we send for you, innit? That's what we're saying, innit? You get me? We play different over here because we're into punching up man and shanking up man in their face and all that thing them now. Yeah, we're selling them hot ones over there, innit? So don't play with us, innit? we different over here, innit? Yeah? And that's what that's what they fear when I'm out, innit? When I'm out, they know that it builds quick, innit? It's like Lego bricks, innit? It builds very, 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 very quick, innit? Yeah, I've got that. I got, I got, I got that thing where I can, uh, um, that that charisma where I can bring people together in it, and that's what I'm doing in it. You feel me? I ain't playing, cuz. Remember, I tell you that. Every time Gigs and Spang was linking the celebs, them, all he was writing under the picture is system. This is going back a little while still. You get me, system. You see, now you're getting to know what's going on, on the roads with the system thing. Told you about these little fucking dickheads. Nana rode up onto his block where he was prince. The dread was king. Bo, E3. Maxine Baker lived in a small council flat on a very quiet street. He parked up in front of her crib in a jet black tinted Benz. Chrome 20 inch rims. New plate. Money. He switched off the engine and leaned back in his chair. Maxine was one of his bitches. 
casual, trusted. He used her spot like a safe. Boxes of crow, bars of sniff. Wap some dark, bullets and bread. Low key vibes. He was zipped up, his black wooded night tracksuit top. He tightened his waistband and fixed the butt of his Glock. He picked up his phone from the top of the dash, punched out 14 digits and held the phone close to his ear. He twisted his neck and scanned the spot. Inside the crib, it was tense. At the top of the house, on the first floor, the untouchables were ready. Sting, Dave and Usler, all of them armed and dressed like the Taliban. Sting was sitting on the white sofa, facing the door. Dave was sitting on the edge of the king-size bed. His 38 Special had become an extension of his arm. Usler was nervous, deep in thought, pacing the floor. Downstairs it was peak. Maxine, Fox and Anthony were stood still, as if they were playing musical chairs. The room was dark, pitch dark. All three were huddled around the living room table. Her phone vibrated. They all looked at the screen and saw that the number was private. Instincts. They all knew it was Nana. Fox produced his Tech 9 and crept to the window. Rubberman vibes. Answer the phone, innit? Keep it calm. Keep it cool. Just say what I told you, Anthony said to Maxine as he reached for and found her hand in the dark. Hey, she answered as she stroked Anthony's hand. Where the fuck are you? Nana asked in an aggressive tone. I'm in my yard. Where the fuck you think I am? Maxine replied, keeping it gang. Anthony smiled. The chick had balls. Random link up, out with the old, in with the new. Nana laughed. Open the door, I'm outside. Saying that, she ended the call. Anthony stood up and reached for his weapon, a Mac-10 submachine gun, leaning against the concrete wall. Just act normal, baby girl. Open the door, turn on your heels, and walk up the stairs, Fox said, as he watched Nana exit the vehicle. She walked out into the hallway and along to the front door. She opened the door and smiled. Nana frowned and stepped into the spot. He closed the door behind him. Are you alone? Of course I'm alone. He closed the distance and was up in her grill. She could smell the alcohol in his breath. Where was you yesterday? You think I'm a fucking prick? Maxine turned on her heels walked towards the stairs and then she answered I went out with my mother is that okay? before Nana could respond Anthony suddenly appeared in the hallway Fox was on his shoulder both of them were bare face twitch gone I dare you make a blood clot move in your dead pussy Nana saw the guns and then shit went into slow motion his heart began to pound his head began to sweat then he threw his hands up in the air. Anthony jammed the machine into Nana's back and walked him up the stairs. The Taliban squad were fully prepared. He was handcuffed and guided to sit on a wooden chair. His ankles were duct taped. You man don't know who you're fucking with, sneered Nana. He didn't appear the least bit frightened. Anthony raised the Mac-10 and smashed it into <coughs> his face. There was a satisfying sound of his nose breaking and he screamed out in pain. Then there was blood. I know who you are. I know your bosses. Speak again without permission and your toast, said Anthony, as he punched him twice in the face. Quick. Shh. Nana opened his mouth and was about to speak. The sight of the Taliban and all of the weapons. His body deflated. Asla grabbed him by the scuff of his neck and patted him down. What the fuck is this? It was a Glock, a 3.6, one of the smallest weapons available on the market. Seven inches in length, 27 ounces in weight, 
six stones to get the job done, semi-automatic. Asla pulled the weapon from, from Nana's waist, passed it to Sting. He liked it, very concealable. Duck tape his hands behind his back, said Anthony, gesturing with his mash. Tell me what you want, and I'll give it to you. Tell me what you want, Nana said, changing his tune. Just keep your mouth shut and follow instructions, said Fox. As he used the duct tape to bind his hands to the chair. I've got 65 racks in this flat, 10 boxes of punk and three bits of dark. Anthony chuckled. <laughs> I located and took that shit last night, bruh. Where's the belly? Asked Fox. 20 minutes later, they were on the move. Anthony, Maxi and Fox walked out of the flat and climbed into the range. Maxine was in the back. Fox was riding shotgun. Showtime, said Anthony as he turned over the engine. He quickly scanned the block and pulled out. Take a right at the end of the road. Then the first left after the traffic lights, instructed Maxine. Anthony stepped on the gas, flipped the indicator. The streets were deserted. He spun the wheel to the right, kept it moving. Maxine directed them to the spot. Anthony cruised past slowly and then took a series of left turns and rode past again. Calm, the block seemed quiet. What door is it? asked Fox, turning around in his seat so he was able to assess Maxine's truth. The black door of the grill, she replied, using her finger to point out the two-storey new build. Anthony manoeuvred the whip behind a white van and parked. What are you thinking, bloody? asked Fox. The calm before the storm, are we about to get paid? I think there's someone in the yard, Anthony replied. The reflection from the street lights made it difficult to see. Fox shaded his eyes with his right hand. I can't see no movement, bloody. Top floor, first window. Fox still at the safe house. You're nodding in agreement. You're right. There's definitely someone in there. Who else has got access to this spot? Asked Anthony, twisting his neck to face Maxine. Oh shit, she replied as a dark coloured Porsche blew past their vehicle. I swear that's the dread. Anthony and Fox looked over the dash and watched the Porsche pull up and park outside their apartment. The dread and his right hand man Nana jumped out of the whip and headed towards the safe house. What are you saying my guy? I'm gonna smoke these punks, said Anthony as he watched them unlock the grill and then disappear. Before he could respond, Fox's phone began to vibrate. The text messages floating across the screen were from Usler, giving them the heads up. He dialed Usler's number. We had to bounce, bro. Mad thing. Shoot up, Usler said, answering his phone. What? Fox said as he put the phone on loudspeaker. Elaborate, my guy. Anthony reversed, stepped on the gas and slowly got the fuck out of there. The road was still semi-calm, but they could have still been watching them from inside the apartment. Nana's niggas blew off the front door. My old fuckers came in booting. They must have been waiting outside. So the rescue mission was successful, asked Fox. Sadly it was. Say nothing, my guy. I'll touch base with you later. Drive safe, said Fox, as he ended the call. Anthony's eyes checked the rear wing mirror. All clear. He stepped on the gas. The Clapton exit was just two miles away. That was where Fox had parked his vehicle. I can't believe that fucking prick got away. What am I going to do now? Asked Maxine. Clearly seeking some form of reassurance. He's going to fucking kill me. Fuck him. I got your baby girl, replied Anthony. This is just a sample from a product of my environment, book free. Real talk. This is how it went down. Motherfucker smoked the wrong nigger. Yeah, man's out here, innit?